Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. A lot to get to on the podcast today, but we are going to lead off with the news that everyone is talking about around SMU. Spring football practice. And we're doing that because we're now a few practices in. The pads have come on and here to give you some more early takeaways on how the Mustangs look. Uh, just approaching a week into spring ball. They started on Thursday. Uh, we've now seen them practice Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and now Tuesday morning in what was the most spirited practice, I would say, of spring ball so far. We'll get to the, the Pac-12 realignment talk. Don't worry, everyone. But I do want to jump in here and begin uh, by letting you guys know that if you're listening to this on Tuesday, we do have our special at OnThePonyExpress.com, $10 for four months, just a few hours remaining on that. So subscribe today. That gets you four months of coverage and uh, basically into the summer for just $10. So do that. Plenty of premium information on the board on recruiting, team, Pac-12 realignment, everything. For the Mustangs in spring ball, you look at the quarterback position. It was really a position that we came into the spring and we said, look, Preston Stone is your starter. He's the one that's going to be tasked with replacing Tanner Mordecai full-time and tasked with taking SMU to the next step when it comes to this new look AAC with the heightened expectations, thanks to that impressive recruiting class, especially on the transfer front. And I still think that's very much the case. I think Preston Stone has looked, you know, pretty good in practice. You know, and Preston is not somebody that a lot of people that have watched him over the years now at SMU would call a practice player. He is a gamer. He has produced at a very high level at the high school level. He has gone into games for SMU and as of late, especially last season, produced at a strong level when called upon. You look at the start to the Tulsa game, you look at him leading that comeback against Cincinnati. He's had his moments, even that touchdown drive late against UCF. He's had his moments where he stepped up, come to the forefront and shown why many people are counting on him to take SMU to a conference championship, to have SMU in position to potentially beat Oklahoma and TCU. All of that is still the case. And we're four practices in now for SMU spring ball. And SMU quarterback Preston Stone looks exactly like that. SMU's quarterback. He's the guy they're going to count on. I say this because he bounces back from this collarbone injury, and he really hasn't missed a beat. He looks the part physically. He looks trim. He His arm motion looks really, I think, probably the quickest it's looked uh, since he's gotten to SMU. I think there's still some adjustment going on as SMU reshuffled the staff a little bit. Johnny Brewer, uh, Rob Likens now taking a little bit more command of that offense alongside Casey Woods and, of course, Rhett Lashley calling plays, uh, but also many new faces at wide receiver. And that is something where as he learns these guys, we've now seen two practices in full pads. He's going to be able to trust them more and more. This is a spring ball that they are, without a doubt, getting a lot of guys work. And we're seeing that. And I would say the team reps early on are fairly limited uh, in a way. You know, they're doing a lot of inside physical run. They're doing a lot of rotating between Preston Stone and Kevin Jennings, who we'll talk about in a second. But Preston has really looked the part as far as throwing the ball physically. And I like that about him. Um, he tucked one today at practice and took it, you know, 70 yards, so to speak. He let up uh, about halfway down the field. But uh, he does show that ability to escape and make plays on that front. Everything looks ship shape with Preston Stone. I still think he's your starter game one. I think he's the guy SMU leans on throughout the season. And I, I would expect him to have success. That said, I left SMU practice today really talking with a lot of people about Kevin Henry Jennings. And you got to give him credit. A state champion at Dallas South Oak Cliff comes into SMU as a true freshman last year, gets called upon in some really key moments, you know, against Tulsa, against Memphis. And he produced and he showed why he has a bright future at SMU. But this is the first day of spring ball that we've really kind of gotten this extended look where we could focus in on the team. There was a lot going on on Saturday when they were in full pads with family day. But Kevin Henry Jennings can absolutely sling it. You can tell he's been in the weight room. You can tell he's been working out, getting stronger and trying to pack on the weight. And I think it's shown with his ball. 
You know, if you go through the practice notes that we posted here and there, Kevin Henry Jennings has thrown a couple deep balls that have been caught and completed and, and impressive ones at that. So I think he's somebody that as spring ball is going along now, of course, we've got one more spring practice Thursday before spring break, and then the team gets a break. But he is somebody making a statement early on in spring ball. I really like what Kevin Henry Jennings is showing so far on the field for SMU. And that's a good thing. You know, Alex Padilla has come in from Iowa and looked kind of exactly what you thought. He looks like a backup. He looks like a guy that's certainly still adjusting. But what you wanted with that was Kevin Henry Jennings to take the next step. And, I mean, he has really done that in a big way. So, impressed with both quarterbacks that SMU caught, you know, called upon last year to play. Now they're taking over uh, the room and being the leaders in the room. And you can tell they're doing that and, and been very impressive in that um, in both their roles. The running back position, I think Jalen Knighton is really shining and, and becoming a clear-cut number one early on. And I say that because you've got Kamar Wheaton suspended. You've got Tyler Levine sitting out in the spring. You've got Velton Gardner, who's looked really good. He caught a pass and made a really nice move um, on, on a ball from, from Kevin Jennings, uh, kind of a swing pass that he checked it down to him. And, you know, he really made a nice move, got upfield. LJ Johnson still progressing in this offense still somebody that is going to have a bright future at SMU in my mind but Jalen Knighton has that pop to him I mean he ran over Chris Adamora on Saturday and really kind of you know let I think the world you know around SMU know hey I'm here I'm here to make plays Preston Stone dumped it down to him um, on a check down in practice on Tuesday he made a couple guys miss before you know it he's 15 yards down the field he's that shifty he's that dynamic um, him running between the tackles you can watch some of the film that we post at on the pony express, uh, dot com or on our YouTube page on the pony express YouTube. Um, and, and you can see him move around really, really well. I, I think he's been even better than I thought he was going to be when he came into SMU. I, I really think, um, Jalen Knighton is, is becoming, you know, a, a guy where you, you see buzz around him becoming a star for SMU in 2023. So Jalen Knighton has been one of the most impressive guys on the field for me. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do that now. It takes two seconds, whether you're on your phone or your computer, just hit that subscribe button for us. Help us keep growing to a thousand subscribers. We appreciate all you guys who have jumped on board since we started this channel. It's now over a year old and uh, we're just keeping it rolling here uh, in the second spring ball of the channel's history. So thanks for doing that. Continuing on with some of the standouts from spring practice. I got to go to the offensive line here. And I got to say, Hyron White has been terrific. I think he's somebody that people aren't going to talk enough about throughout the offseason. You're going to look at a Ja'Kai Clark from Miami coming in. Um, you're going to look at all the star power at the skill positions that SMU brought in. And P.J. Williams, of course, who saw his first action of uh, spring ball and full pads on Tuesday after getting you know some time kind of to acclimate a little bit, he got his first action in pads. Looked good as well. But Hyron White, for 2023, his one year left of college football, he is a massive human. He moves the pile. And he can move for a big man, too. I was surprised. I, I just think his size, you have him opposite of uh, Marcus Bryant. And, you know, he's somebody that towers in a way, kind of over... Marcus Bryant and it's just his pure size that he has put together out there on the field and Marcus Bryant still that guy that was always tall but has bulked up and bulked up and bulked up Hyron White is just a massive dude and he you know told Preston Stone Preston Stone talked to the media on Saturday after practice and he told Preston you know don't worry I got you no way he's gonna touch you back there which is actually pretty funny uh coming from such a big dude talking to to, to Preston I mean not that Preston small but that's how big Hyron is. So I can imagine the conversation and how it went. But Hyron White's going to be a major key for this offensive line. I'm impressed with what Ben Sparks has done as, as well. He's playing in that right guard spot for SMU right now during spring as Justin Osborne is recovering from you know an injury, kind of uh, in a way taking the spring off to, to recover um, from what I've gathered. So you look at Ben Sparks, he is battling his tail off to make sure that he is in one of those starting right guard or one of those starting guard positions come the fall. We know SMU is bringing in Logan Parr in the summer. We know SMU is bringing in Ja'Kai Clark in the summer. You have Branson Hickman at center. 
somebody's got to hold on hold on to those guard spots. And Justin Osborne is a guy that has played a lot of quality football for SMU too. So where does that leave Ben Sparks? I tell you, he's putting together a really nice spring. Another guy people aren't talking enough about. On the defensive line, I think this is a group that is so much fun to watch. And I, I say that because they're all so big and they all move around so well. And Jalen Samuels, we know, is suspended um, right now by SMU. But I, I just got to say, Jordan Miller, Elijah Roberts, Devere Levelston, Elijah Chapman, who's, who's having some fun this spring, Nelson Paul, Isaiah Smith. It's just a completely different feel around that front. And I think you have to be excited about it if you're an SMU fan. The linebackers behind them, you have Ahmad Walker, who's going to start. You have linebackers who are completely battling for starting job. Chris Adamora, Jaquandis Burns, Alex Kilgore. Those are all guys with real chances to start. And Alex Kilgore is making some waves in that regard. But Jaquandis Burns is not back down. He's been all out physical, really kind of laying the wood in practice. But that defensive line, when you look at it and you go out to an SMU practice now, it's different. It is just a night and day look up there uh, in the trenches. And it's something that SMU hasn't had in a while. I mean, I would really have to go back and dig deep to try to find out what group looked like that in the last decade and a half. So SMU has really addressed the trenches with size. Uh, I think it's an impressive look. Um, and, and, you know, they'll add Kevin Allen this summer. They'll add Day Day Wimberly this summer. It's going to be a group that continues to look better and better. The secondary is a very hotly contested position group right now. You have Jonathan McGill, who's a very clear-cut starter. And then in the other safety spots, you have Brian Massey and Ahmad Moses, um, Brandon Crosley, C.J. Sanders, all guys who are battling for, for time at safety, and all of them have shown different flashes. Brian Massey had an interception in a one-on-one today. Um, Brandon Crosley had an interception and, and had a nice pop in team. Um, CJ Sanders had a nice pop in team. This is a group that really you could tell is pushing each other. And the same could be said for corner AJ Davis, Chris Megginson, Jalen Davis Robinson, Charles Woods. The edge that SMU kind of plays with now, it's different. And I know it's practice, and and you know, we can all kind of see that. It's not no pad all Americans since they're in the pads now, but it is practice. It is against your teammates, but there is a little bit of an edge in competition now. And I, I think part of this, you've got to give the credit to the defensive coaches too, for one, bringing obviously in some talent, but watching practice, they get after them and they get after them in a different way than they necessarily did last year. Last year was a lot of learning, a lot of, and I think part of this is why the team held together so well and finished strong, quite honestly we know there was a talent deficiency in the secondary last year. And we know there were positions that they had to make do with what they had. But they treated those guys, it just got to the point where they couldn't do anything necessarily. And, and that's no fault you know, to the players that were in those positions and things like that. But now with this group and how much deeper it is, it's different they can treat them differently because they're expected to play at a higher level because there's competition, because your job is going to be taken if you don't produce. So it's not, Hey, I got to love on you. Cause you're all I got. I want you to quit on me. But now it's, Hey, you can play better than this. You can elevate your game. And we saw that last year with Brandon Crosley, who's had a strong spring as well. Brandon Crosley finished the 2022 season very well. He was trending up. He's continued that in the spring. I think part of it is how they handled everything with him and multiple guys on the secondary. So I'm really impressed with the competition level in the secondary. Guys are making competitive plays. There's good coverage. And I, I just, I even think, you know, you look at a guy like Isaiah Wachobia. He's out there in a red jersey. They're being careful with him, but he's practicing. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with him. Obviously, his kind of status all along has been somewhat up in the air, but, you know, he's not in the transfer portal. He's out there practicing. He's been up with the twos here and there. And that's the type of competitiveness they're building in the room. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the safety group, um, but a really impressive group nonetheless. I do want to say, watching Jordan Curley, and there's been times where he hasn't necessarily gotten the ball to him uh, for whatever reason, whether there's been pressure on the quarterback or whatever, he is playing at a very high level right now. 
he's running by guys. Jake Bailey, they're being very careful with. He's been relatively well protected um, and kind of working off the side. And Dylan Goffney is doing the same as they both come back from injury. And that's allowed Jordan Curley to really step up. And he is playing at a very high level. He got open. He got so open today um, and, and just kind of the ball was late, um, quite honestly, from, from Preston Stone. And and uh, I think Brian Massey was able to break it up. But he was so open. It's, it's on our practice tape. You can go back and watch it. The ball just came too late, but he was so open. And I think that's what we're in for uh, this year a lot, quite honestly. Jordan Curley is having a huge, um, huge spring in terms of what he's brought to the table. He's already put on 10 to 15 pounds. He's working back there at you know kick return and punt return when they do those type of drills. They're not really doing much live stuff, but he's poised for a big year. So um, Romello Brinson, another guy I do want to mention, very freaky athlete. Keyshawn Smith uh, continuing to develop. I think he needs to work on the jugs a little bit. Watch some, you know, just kind of, you know, hand, you know, he's dropped a few balls. I'll be honest with you. And, you know, he's got to get that together, but you can see the flashes that he brings. And then we caught up with Roger Daniels today. Catch it on our YouTube channel. He was awesome. He's playing with a ton of confidence, and you can tell he's so appreciative to be with the team. Um, so I'm. I was. Uh, I haven't. I haven't talked with Rod since he was a recruit, and you can just tell he's. He's a different dude, and and you know everything he's been through the last year, you know, will probably do that to you in in a way and and mature you pretty quickly. But he's just been uh, awesome for SMU um, in that wide receiver room. So I don't want to really you know run it all down, but I do want to give some of those early standouts so far from spring ball uh, and kind of, you know, end with that um, as we, you know, we'll get to kind of a uh, reset point with spring break here. So we'll talk more. We'll go in depth. We'll do a real long podcast for you guys to check out as spring ball. We'll take a break um, after Thursday for spring, for spring break. And then uh, we'll kind of reset some things. We'll do some recruiting talk and all of that and uh, get you get you ready for the rest of spring ball before that April 14th spring game. So, quick reminder, subscribe to OnThePonyExpress.com, $10 for four months if you get in by Tuesday night at midnight. If you can't, well, you better have a good reason because uh, that deal is not coming back uh, as far as I know. So maybe you can get lucky and get on Wednesday if it's somehow extended, but uh, for right now, ends Tuesday at midnight. Now, we're going to jump into that Pac-12 talk. And... We dropped the insider article on on theponyexpress.com on Monday asking, is this a week for SMU to the Pac-12? And it doesn't necessarily look like that's going to be the case. But there's caveats to everything. And that is what we've kind of talked about with realignment on many levels in many different ways, including, you know, Monday's podcast. And this is where it gets interesting to me. And I was talking with a bunch of people, been working a lot of the phones. There's the reality that the Pac-12 media rights deal is in the final stages. And Tuesday, as you're listening to this, the, the meeting with the Pac-12 presidents, it's probably wrapped up. In that meeting, George Klyovkov is supposed, is supposed to update the latest and greatest on the Pac-12 media rights deal. And a lot of schools have meetings scheduled for their boards on Wednesday to discuss just just that. A couple have multiple meetings over the course of the next week. And there's been this, this dead zone of Big 12 taking the Pac-12 kind of propaganda over the last like day and a half since it was kind of come out that it's it's entering the final stages, which we reported, Pete Thamel reported, things are in the final stages. And what does that look like? Does that mean that by the end of the week, we're going to see someone say, everybody talked with their schools, everybody talked with their people, and they said, great, the media rights deal's done. Here you go. Expect SMU and San Diego State to be invited to the Pac-12 formally. They've got to apply first, which is a formality once it gets to that point. And if that is all the case and it's in the final stages, we won't see an announcement for multiple weeks. And we talked about this, I want to say maybe early January or maybe December even. And you 
you see these things reported, these moves made like OU and Texas to the SEC. Well, fast forward the time frame, they weren't officially announced by the league and by you know their own from their own schools until a few a couple months later. So there's the the interesting piece of this Pac-12 media rights deal and invitations and expansion is how does it happen? How did do, how does it go about being reported? And that's probably the biggest question that I'm wrestling with. A lot of the people that are covering it on a day to day basis are cover are, are struggling with is what does it look like? Because this is a, a week that a lot of people have talked about as okay, they've got the Big Twelve tournament in Las Vegas. They're going to meet. They're going to try to finalize some things. And uh, they're going to kind of go from there. That might not be the case, but it might be. And both can be true. A formal invite might not come. A formal media rights deal might not come. But they can finalize things and get them across the finish line that they need to to have a deal in place for them to move forward as a league and to extend invitations. And this is a little bit of kind of opinion more so but the the biggest issue with the Pac-12 and how this whole thing has gone about very publicly very in your face on many levels whether it's people saying no the Pac-12 is going to fall apart or others are going to say no they're going to expand to be fine get a media rights deal is there's no narrative being there's no they're not controlling any narrative you know we saw a couple of presidents speak out and say we're expecting mid-March. Well, we're not at mid-March just yet. We've got a whole nother week until that hits. So there is a possibility that things can still happen right around the mid-March time frame. And what I had said this week was that there was considerable buzz that the finalization of things could happen. And it seems like that's still at least possible. That doesn't mean they're going to announce it. That doesn't mean... Uh, you know, anything from the Pac-12 is going to come out because all these things are not dead set and and done. Nothing's signed, nothing's done, nothing, no one's applied, no one's been invited. It's just the expectation is there. And it's it's hard to necessarily sift through what's like whenever SMU and San Diego State, if they are invited, and if the media rights deal is done. Whenever that happens, people are going to be like, okay, uh, that just exactly what so-and-so and so-and-so were saying the whole time. It happened. Now, oh, okay, we got to wait probably about a month and a half for formal invitation or formal application, be approved, and then announcement coming, you know, May. That's, that's there's nothing, the, the big new, the two big pieces of news that could happen. Are the Pac-12 falling apart, which, according to my sources, according to multiple sources, seems unlikely because they are in the final stages of finalizing that media rights deal. That's what I've heard. That's what Pete Thamel heard. He reported it. There's a lot of people that are saying, this thing's at the goal line. You know, this is close. Well, okay, well then, well, it should be done. But what does that look like? And there's, you know... Part of it all that sucks that it's being dra dragged out. It sucks that, you know, people don't have the answer yet. And, but in the end, as long as it gets done, they're really, it really doesn't matter. You know, whatever the Pac-12 gets in a, in a media, media rights deal is going to be a first time deal for a college league. And so somewhere along the line, there's got to be a lot of things that are worked out, talked about, agreed upon from the top to the bottom of it. So that is where this thing gets dicey as far as trying to say, and which is why I've been, for the most part, relatively careful about trying to pin down a date or a time, is it's, it's starting from scratch with Amazon and Apple. They have pieces from ESPN, but it is starting from scratch. So it's a very unique situation. 
And I talked to a couple of people this morning and a lot of confidence, a lot of buzz. And those are from a couple of people that I trust. It's just a matter of, well, when does it, when does it get broken that the deal is done? When does it get uh, broken that SMU is going to apply in San Diego State and they're going to be accepted? How does that all, all that look? How does it happen? It could be end of this week. It could be next week. That's still mid-March. But, I mean, I'm not trying to move the goalpost because I am trying to say and have said that as long as the deal is done is it's, and it's good and it holds the league together, and in SMU's case, in San Diego State, they get invited, nobody really cares. You know, the Pac-12 still has a whole other year on their deal. They still have time. But they've got to get it done in the sense that you don't want to go into the season with people having opportunities to, you know, shop to truly shop themselves around. And a lot of the Big 12 corner four corner school stuff makes a lot of sense. I mean, SMU is talking to the Big 12 still. We've said that. We've reported that. Why aren't the why are, why is it a surprise that the other schools are doing that as well? And that doesn't necessarily mean none of them are going. Things are in the final stages of the Pac-12 and their media rights deal. And that's the key piece. That's the big portion of this. I thought it was going to be this week as far as like a formal agreement being done. I don't know if that is going to be the case. But what I do think, based on my sources, is that SMU and San Diego State are very much the ones that are going to be invited when this thing is all said and done. So not trying to move the goalposts, but there's certainly an interesting element to watching this whole thing unfold and trying to nail down a time timeline has proven to be a very tall task. And before the season, I punted. I said, after the season, I said, I just don't see it. It's a massive deal. It's, it's something that has to be worked out. It, it seems like they're in a weird position. George Klyovkov cleaning up everything Larry Scott did. And that holds true. And I still think there's there's things that he's cleaning up. And I thought mid-March would be a would be the time that they would finally have it done. We've got seven days to find out. It's going to be a, an interesting ride. It's just a matter of trying to nail down this time frame is really difficult. But you see various levels of bizarre kind of uh, oxymorons when it comes to reporting. Okay, it's in the final stages. It's down the road. It's, it's, on, it's on the goal line. But at the same time, the Pac-12 is going to fall apart. Doesn't make sense to me. A lot of realignment stuff doesn't. I have not heard that the Pac-12 is going to fall apart. I've not heard that they're going to splinter. All I keep hearing about, and I've kicked around a, lot, a, a few national sources on this and people that I trust in on the television side of it. And this is one that that there's a lot of people that are trying to change the outcome. And they're aggressive about it to ultimately help the Big 12. And that's the goal is to help your conference. So it's not no surprise there's a Big 12, Pac-12 war going on. But I think the Pac-12 is going to end up staying together and getting a new right, rights deal, inviting SMU and San Diego State. We'll just have to keep tracking it. So we will continue to keep you updated at OnThePonyExpress.com. Please give, give us a uh, like, throw us a subscribe. Appreciate all you guys who have supported the channel. Thanks for listening to this edition of the podcast, and we will catch you guys later in the week as SMU Spring Ball rolls on and we continue to track Pac-12 realignment. Thanks for listening and have a good one, everyone.